Good morning, everyone. Ooh, it's warm in here, right? Fair to outside. Well, let's sing this and declare it together. Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. Forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Father, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours. It's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever. The kingdom is yours. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. right here in my heart. Amen. Y'all take a seat. We are so excited to announce our very first B Women's Conference here at Southern Lakes Church. There are many times in the Word of God where it says to be something. And so we have chosen the theme of be rooted for this very first conference. Being rooted in Christ means being grounded in His love and His truth and His purpose for our lives. And we won't be swayed by anything else that tries to take our attention. And that is the reason why I'm so excited about our speaker, Laura Sandretti. She is an author and speaker whose passion is to encourage women and to provide them practical ways to live daily with peace, hope, and freedom in Jesus Christ. In addition to our speaker, there will also be breakout sessions, which focus on all different aspects of what it means to be rooted in Christ. So mark your calendars for March 16th, 2024. We really hope you'll join us. Yes, yes, yes. Our women's ministry team is so excited about this, my wife included. Very excited. Um, we are, are having our very first Women's B Conference. Um, very exciting. Hey, I promised in December that they would have registration up, and it is up. So register, women of our church. It is going to be a phenomenal day. Um, and if you, if you uh, register today, the pricing is lower than as you get closer to the conference. So take advantage of that. All the details, all the information, the schedule, some links to the, the keynote speaker, a, a very well-known speaker in our area. She's going to do a phenomenal job. 
Again, women, you're not going to want to miss this. So please go online, register for that. Hey, uh, if you're a guest with us today or, or maybe visiting or, or what have you, thank you for being here. We are so thankful that you are here. We'd love you to communicate with us. Just let us know who you are by filling out our communication card. Uh, you'll see that in the chair rack in front of you. We also have one available on our website. Um, once you fill that out in-house, you can put that in the uh, giving boxes in the back of the room. Or, better yet, you can take it to our Welcome Center, and someone will be there to answer questions for you. We'd love to give you a gift and, and just, again, get to know you a little bit there. So please do that uh, for us. Hey, some other things coming up. We have a men's conference. Uh, no regrets. A great conference. The theme this year is Fearless. We're going to be kind of hosting as a host site for this. It's going to be live streamed in um, here on February 3rd. Men of our church, again, like I said just a moment ago for our women, don't want to miss this. It's going to be an amazing conference, some amazing speakers, really a great challenge and encouragement to be men uh, who, who stand for God and stand for our families and, and et cetera. So please be here for that. Another great opportunity, another conference. Man, this is the time of year to announce conferences. We got uh, something called Weekend to Remember. This is a marriage conference um, that we've been kind of promoting the last couple of years. There's two opportunities for this. The first is in uh, February, late February, that weekend in Appleton. My wife and I went to that one last year. An amazing conference. Um, again, if you are married, this might be what you need, just to kind of ni a nice encouragement, uh, maybe some challenge, maybe some way to, to reconnect with your spouse. It's a phenomenal weekend. There's another offering in April in Madison, but we'll kind of announce that one as we get a little closer. Again, you'll have to go to their website to register, uh, but there is also a pretty good, like there's a 50% off or so right now before the end of the month. So if you want to go to this, go on their website and register for that wonderful conference. Some of very important dates coming up. Uh, this very next Sunday is uh, what was called, we're calling the Family Center Vision Reveal, an amazing night where you're going to hear about some, some really, really big stuff coming right around um, us in, in the next couple of months here. So this is going to kind of lead us off. So if you've not heard about some of this stuff, this is for you. We want you to be there. 4 p.m. Um, that Sunday, that's this upcoming Sunday, please be here. There will be refreshments, an amazing uh, program, kind of time up here in the, in the sanctuary, and just some time to get, get together on, on some amazing things. So please be there. Also, the following week, we have our annual congregational meeting. Um, and again, uh, this meeting will kind of come out of that other one. So we'll be voting on some things that that Family Center Reveal talks about. So please be there at the Family Center Reveal. Also, be at the congregational meeting um, at noon on the 28th. We'll be voting on several things, especially if you're a member. Please be there. One last thing, baptism service coming up on February 11th. If you um, or maybe your, your child um, or if you want to give this information to someone else that you do know of that would like to be baptized, we're going to be having a, a, a baptism service on that date. Um, we, rather than having informational meetings, which sometimes we do, we'd like you to just c contact our church office directly. Contact our church office if this is something you're interested in, or again, um, have a child that you're interested in getting baptized, and Pastor Ken will connect with you, get you everything you need um, before that date. With all that, I'm going to invite Pastor Nate up. Good morning. Well, I get uh, to celebrate. Uh, part of what we do around here is try to show love and share Jesus in some very practical ways. And uh, you guys did that over our Christmas Eve offering. And I just wanted to celebrate with you the total that we were able to collect this year is 3939 that money is going to be going towards um, hygiene packs that are going to help our local prisoners as they come out of the Walworth County system and just some real practical needs that will be helpful for them as they begin to assimilate back into our community, um, including a gospel track and invitations, of course, to join us because we want to continue to be able to show love and share Jesus. It's all part of it is part of your giving and your generosity and your kindness and so thank Thank you for that. Continue to do so in our general way for our offering. You can do that in the giving boxes in the back or do that online if that is a one way that you want to continue to express your worship to our God in that way. Will you join me in prayer for the rest of our service this morning? God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for the ways that you have nudged each of us to sacrifice and to be generous with our time, with our talents, as well as our resources. May we continue just in a spirit of worship and giving you our hearts, our minds, our anxieties, our worries. Just draw us into worship today. May we hear from you through the music, through the fellowship, through the word, and our time together. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. Will you stand with us? This song is a prayer. A prayer that God would ultimately help us, make us into his design. So let's sing, let's listen, let's participate in this together. before you, may we surrender. May we surrender to you. I surrender all. I surrender all. Sing it, church. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Again. I 
start our next song, I want to read this scripture out of the book of Revelation. In chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus is speaking and he says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We're singing a song this morning called, Come, O Lord Maranatha. Maranatha, that beautiful word, means come, Lord Jesus. And we know the promise is Christ will return. Either he will come to us or we will go to him, right? Pastor Ken's going to be talking about the reality of faithfulness today. In, that, in the wonderful parable, it says, the master comes for the one that has been faithful and says, good, well, good, yeah, well done, sorry. Well done, good and faithful servant. As we sing this song, maybe have a heart check a little bit. Are you walking faithfully? Are you ready to see your Lord face to face? Is it frighten you or does it get you excited? Where, where are you at? How has your life been as you've been following Jesus? How are you being faithful in your life to him? Let's sing and declare these beautiful truths together today.
see your beauty with our very eyes. Come in all your glory, shining like the sun. Roar like many waters, let your kingdom come. Come and rend the heavens, rip them. today and for the opportunity to come before you and to be in your house and to be with fellow believers and to worship you and to praise you. Lord, you are worthy of all of it and more than we can give. And Lord, I pray that you would work in each one of our hearts and in our minds that we can focus on you and your will for us. Lord, thank you for sending us your son and giving us salvation and the opportunity to be your children. The words that are spoken today that you uh, would just work through them. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Well, here we are, brand new year, at least some of us. Everybody else went to Florida today. <laughs> What's with that, right? How many of you are planners? You know, you got your year planned out, you got things coming down the pike. And so how many of you know that God laughs at your plans? Yeah, I, I, I see that over and over again. See, I, I knew I was going to hit the ground running in the new year. Like I always plan to, and you know, it's going to be glorious, and I was going to start this new sermon series on, on the 7th, and, and, and you know, be a success, talk about true success and all that. God had some other plans, right? Um, I've been sick, as many of you know, for a very long time. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I, I'm just talking about physically, I've not been well, barely got through the Christmas Eve service here by the grace of God. And then I was uh, very uh, not well on Christmas Day and days after that, and it's just been a, a long slug. Uh, had a really bad cold and cough and all the rest of that. And then on top of that, you know, weakened the, the system and got COVID on top of that. So uh, Dawn and I have had quite a time. And I, I just want to say, you know, uh, God's plans are always better, and uh, praise God. In fact, it, it really worked out well because uh, the way I had the series laid out and the way God had it laid out were, were totally different. Josiah started last week with talking about abiding in Christ. And, and the more I heard him speak and I saw how that laid out, I thought, you know what? That is perfect. That is the perfect place to start with all of this 
uh, rather than where I had planned on, on starting. And so God's plan is always better. And let me just say, uh, Josiah, I don't know where he went, but uh, a big shout out to Josiah. Uh, I gave him the audible on Thursday and uh, he pulled it together, did a fantastic job. Can we just praise the Lord for that? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, you know, just an indication of faithfulness, what we were talking about today, uh, our staff as well. It's just been tremendous to just see. We, we have such a staff, and, and uh, I know we all take them for granted, and we shouldn't because they are amazing. And so many people, not just the staff, but so many volunteers around here. You know, I drove in this morning, and somebody's shoveling snow out there in that, in that cold, cold, cold. And just, it just takes so many people to do all the things that happen uh, around this uh, church and all the things that we're doing. And I just want to praise God uh, for all of this. I also want to say, um, yeah, praise God. I also want to just say thank you to our live stream team. I know JD's gone with the kids up to districts this weekend, and please pray for them. And uh, they're coming back later today. But um, fantastic job. And I, I really appreciated it when I was uh, ill the last two Sundays to be able to sit home and still be able to connect with this church body in that way. Never use it as a substitute, okay? We want you to be here, but uh, when you need it, it's there by the grace of God, and uh, I'm just so thankful for all that they do. So, you know, God's plans are always better than ours. Uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't plan, but we should always be grateful, and I'm truly grateful. You don't know how grateful I am to be able to be here today and at least have about 80% of my voice back by the grace of God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for all that you teach us and you're taking us through in our lives. Uh, we just give you the glory. Uh, I thank you for this church, and I thank you for the many, many faithful servants that you have called and gifted and are continuing to energize here. Uh, I pray as I preach this sermon today that we would be even further energized to be faithful for you. Let your words be my words. Uh, may you strengthen my voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been talking about true success now. We started the series last week on true success, but what is true success? Josiah did a great job of introducing it, but let me kind of reintroduce the subject to you. And uh, when you start talking about this, this subject of success, there are a lot of different definitions, right? If you're Chick-fil-A, What's the definition? Well, you know, they were the creator of the double drive through You know that, right? They're going for four now. Count them up, you know? They're going to probably put the restaurant right above, and, and, you know, maybe they'll be the first one with 10 lanes for a drive through I don't know. Uh, for them, that might be success. Uh, if, if you're Apple, you know, you're, you're thinking of the next thing, right? And so they're on to iPhone 15, and I'm on like iPhone 3, you know, whatever. Actually, I think I got 11, something like 10. 10 is what I got. So they're five ahead of me already. A amazing there. And, and this thing, you know, iPhone 15. How many of you got iPhone 15? One guy right there. Okay, invite them over to your house. It washes dishes. I mean, it does everything. It's amazing. So if you're Apple, I mean, you know, you got a whole different definition of success. If you're the Chicago Bears, how do you define success? Well, you know, it's having the first round pick in the draft so you can finally draft a quarterback that might be able to beat the Packers. I mean, just saying 10 and 0, hey, you know, don't know what's going to happen today, but, you know, that was last week. When it comes to success, there are a lot of different ways to define it. And for our purposes here, we're not just talking about success in the general realm. We're talking about true success. What does true success look like? True success has to do with God and, and God's purposes lived out in our lives, living a life for the glory of God. True success, as Josiah very well pointed last week, uh, it looks like what? It looks like fruitfulness in our lives. It begins with that abiding, John 15. If we will abide in him and he'll abide in us, we will be fruitful. If we're disconnected from the vine, we're not going to bear any fruit. It all starts there, right? That's what true success looks like, is being connected to our maker, connected to our savior, and then bearing fruit in our lives. It also looks like obedience. Uh, next week, Nate 
is going to be talking about obedience. And this is another aspect. It's just the word of God. This is what Joshua said. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. That's true success is taking God at his word and and living it out every single day. Today, we want to talk about another aspect of that, and that is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Uh, What does it mean? It means being full of faith. That's That's where the word comes from. It's full of faith. It's living for God. It's being trustworthy. It's being dependable. It's being consistent in our lives. Faithfulness is essential to every other area. If you want to have a good marriage, you got to be faithful. You want to have a a, a great family, you got to be faithful. If we want to have a great church, we've got to be faithful. No matter what area of life it is, there's got to be this faithfulness in our lives. And so let's learn about that today. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be drinking on the job today. Water, of course. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 44, is an amazing display of faithfulness. Now, there are many other places we could go in the Bible. You know that, right? You know, we could look at Esther. We could look at Job. We could look at Daniel. We could look at David. We could go all through the scriptures and find all kinds of amazing examples of faithfulness, but for some reason, as I prayed about this and I said, God, where would you direct our thoughts today? And this is different, by the way. I was going to preach a whole different message last week, and God just kind of turned this on a dime and, and directed me to Acts chapter 16, where we see this amazing display of faithfulness by Paul and Silas. Let me give you a little background to chapter 16 right here. Uh, the apostle Paul receives this, what we call the Macedonian call. You can read about that down in uh, verse 6 and following right there. Verse number 9 says, come on over here to Macedonia and help us. So he, he sees this vision in the night, and they're being called to Macedonia in this next leg of their missionary journey. He takes with him uh, Silas and Timothy and Luke, and they go over to Macedonia, which is a brand new area where they're stepping in to preach the gospel. They end up in a place called Philippi, <clears throat> a prominent area. And they meet somebody called Lydia. And you can read about it all here in the first part of the chapter. Uh, They lead Lydia to Jesus. She becomes a believer. Other people become believers. And the church is born in Philippi. Amazing story. We pick it up here then in verse number 16. And I'm going to go all the way down through verse 34. So hang in there with me. At least I think I'm going to. Now it happened as they went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men were the servants of the Most High God, who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, and dragged them into the marketplace and to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had uh, laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison and uh, commanded the jailer to keep them securely. Uh, Having received the charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. We'll talk about that in a little bit, what that was about. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, And everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors were open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. 
Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of God, spoke the word of the Lord to them and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when they had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Again, amazing to read the book of Acts and the, and the things that took place in the early church. But uh, as you read this passage, you know, the world would look at Paul and Silas and say, what a couple of failures. Man, you know, low-paying job, missionary work, hard stuff, you know. Uh, got to do a lot of travel, and, and people weren't appreciative, and they're in trouble with the law. They get beaten, they're bloody, they're locked up, forgotten about. I mean, talk about a couple of losers, right? But you see, that's the way the world often looks at it. But God has a completely different perspective when it comes to success. And what God saw was two successful men who were faithful to him, that were willing to go, that were willing to sacrifice and, and lay down their lives to preach the gospel so that others could hear. He saw men that were willing to suffer in Jesus' name. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see this story and I, and I think about it, it's like, wow, that's what I want in my life. I want to be more like that. I want to be faithful day in and day out. Uh, through the thick and the thin, the easy and the hard. I want to be like Paul and Silas and singing praises at midnight, no matter what's going on in my life. And so I think we got a lot to learn from them, a lot to learn from them. And so I want to just draw out quickly three marks, or if you would, keys to what made them, I believe, a success and what was behind their success. Uh, the first thing that we see right here is their faithfulness was rooted in the rock, that rock was Jesus Christ. Their faithfulness was rooted in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10.4 says, For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Jesus Christ. He used to be our rock. He used to be our, our cornerstone, and he was for them. Uh, they, were, they were faithful. Uh, they were faithful in a big, big way, and, and God blessed that, Right? Where were Paul and Silas headed? As you look at verse 16, where were they headed when, they, when, when all this happened? It says, as it happened, as we went to prayer. They were on their way to pray. When they connected with Lydia, it was all about prayer. Prayer is what led them to Macedonia, to Philippi. Prayer is what birthed the church and people coming to know Jesus. You see, Paul and Silas had a life that was grounded that was rooted in a prayerful relationship, fellowship with their Lord. And that's what we need as well. Now, I don't know about their daily God time, what it looked like if they had, you know, a scripture reading uh, schedule or something like that. I, I, I highly doubt it, right? I don't know what that looked like on a daily basis for them, but we do know that they were firmly, firmly rooted in this rock, their Savior, Jesus Christ, that's why they were serving as missionaries. That's why they were proclaiming the way of salvation to the Philippians. That's why uh, they were willing to be beaten. And at midnight, you see them singing and praising God. Amazing, right? This past summer, <clears throat> when it was a lot warmer and nicer out, uh, back in August, Dawn and I had an opportunity to go up to the upper Michigan and, um, and see the... Um, the pictured rocks. Go back one, one slide there, Constance. And, um, and I saw this picture. We took a boat ride along the shore, and, and they told this story about this amazing site, and I don't know how well you can see it uh, from your seat there, but, but the water's way down here, and there's some, some little tiny people, so you get the idea there. But up here was this tree, and it's out here on this rock all by itself, but it's alive. How can it be alive? Well, it's got these roots that go back to the shore. What happened over the years is this rock faded away, but it was still connected to what? 
to the sustenance, right? Now you can go on to the next uh, slide, maybe see it a little bit better here, the roots that were there and the rock that's up there. And, and the first thing that, that struck me, I said, you know, I'm going to use this as an illustration someday because I thought that's a picture of abiding in Christ, what Josiah talked about last week. That's a picture of being rooted in your Savior. So no matter what happens, you're going to be fine. That tree was green, it was alive. Can you imagine all the storms that tree has seen over the years on that shore of, of the UP uh, coming off the lake there? Uh, I mean, it's been battered, it's been cold, cold, hot, hot, windy, but it stands strong because why? It's rooted. And my friends, that's the same for you and me. Uh, we can withstand the storms of life no matter what the world sends at us, no matter what Satan sends our way, if we are rooted in the rock, Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul and Silas were. That's why they were so faithful, if you would. Now, the problem, in contrast with the girl and her masters, is they were not. They were not rooted in Jesus Christ. They weren't rooted in the rock. Verse number 16 talks about this girl having a spirit of divination. That word divination, interestingly enough, is the word python in the Greek. And I got thinking about that, you know, what's that all about? And it really goes back to the fact that they, the Greeks believed, you know, all this mythology that there was this big, mighty python, and Apollo put him down, killed the python. And so Apollo became this mighty Greek god, and guess what the symbol was for Apollo? The python. And what this girl was, was basically, she was a ventriloquist, she was speaking with an evil spirit, and, and they were just using her, her masters were using her uh, to just speak divination, to speak fortune-telling, future stuff, uh, as if Apollo was speaking through her. And that's how they made their fortune. And, and that's why they got so upset when Paul and, and Silas, you know, cast out the demon that was in here because now their livelihood was going to be gone. They didn't care about her. They just cared about the money. Now, true success is not like that. And yet people get it all wrong. They think it is. Uh, many people in our world today, they think true success is found in what? They think it's found in fame, right? It's like, hey, man, how you doing? How many followers do you have? Uh, it's all about how you look, you know, it's all that kind of thing. Is, is that what true success is at? No. Uh, people say, well, it's certainly in fortune. You know, I, I got to have all this money and how much money do you have in your bank account? What's your portfolio look like? And, oh, do you have lots of stuff that money can buy? Uh, that's where it's at. Or, or maybe it's in all kinds of other worldly measures, and there's many of them out there, Right awards and accolades and degrees and whatever else it is. Like, look at me, man. I'm so successful. Well, I'm here to tell you, my friend, that you can have success in all those areas and not be a true success in the eyes of God. Because that's not how God measures success. Not at all. True success is found in being faithful, and the key to being faithful is found in being rooted in, in Jesus Christ, having a vibrant relationship with him. So what would you rather be? Would you rather be like this servant girl, you know, possessed with a spirit of divination, or like her masters who were just in it for the money, or would you like to be like Saul, uh, Silas, and Paul? I know who I would want to be like, but the key is abiding in Christ. He is the vine. We are the branches. Are you abiding in him today? Let me ask you this. Prayer was a big part of who they were. They were all about, what is your prayer life like as you step into this new year? Really, what is your prayer life like? Are you connected and are you connecting with your Lord? Are you standing on that rock? That was a key to why they were faithful. They were connected. The next key we find here is their faithfulness was unconditional. Unconditional. What Paul and Silas went through was horrific. I mean, we, we don't get the true picture. Or, you know, it's all not blown out and all of its ugliness right here. Uh, we're just told what happened. But basically, they were falsely accused. They were arrested. Uh, they were seized, violently taken to the authorities, humiliated. They were stripped down. They were beaten with rods. And you can only imagine what that was like. Some great big honking pieces of willow. 
that would slap across the back, be worse than a whip, and, and just, I'm sure it wasn't a pleasant. They were, they were going to teach them a lesson. Paul went through this, he said, three times, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five. he said, three times I received stripes. This was one of those three occasions where he was beaten bloody. And then they were thrown into prison. Their feet were put in stocks. And what you have to think about these stocks is it wasn't just to hold their feet. Uh, from what I read is they were meant to spread their feet apart and to increase their pain. And so they're bloody. It's midnight. They're, they're stuck in the prison. What would that be like? I mean, what would it have been like to go through all that? What would it be like to be in prison? It would have been no picnic. Okay, there was no television. There was no three square meals a day. It was dark. It was damp. It was lonely. It was meant to be a mess. They were in the inner secure prison. And yet, what were they doing? <laughs> They're praising God. They were being faithful in that situation. Now, I don't know about you, but I can just imagine what I probably would have done. I would have been like, God, really? You know, this is what I get for serving you. I mean, I was preaching your word when all this, wait, couldn't you protect me? Why now, God? You know, that's what we have a tendency to do. We, we have a tendency to blame and, and, and to complain and all those other things. But that's not what they were doing. In fact, they were faithful in spite of all that. It was unconditional. They weren't faithful when it was just easy. They were faithful also when it was Talk about inspiration for us, right? How powerful is that? That at midnight, they're praising God. They're doing all these things because they were faithful. It reminds me of Job. <clears throat> you know, you go back in the Bible and you read the, the story of Job and what happened to him and, and he was a faithful man. And God allowed Satan to come and destroy all that he had, destroyed his 10 children, took his health, I mean, he was a miserable wreck, and yet, what did he do? He was faithful. He praised God. He never complained. He did not blame God. He worshiped God. Oh, that we might be like that, right? We usually aren't, as I speak for myself. Uh, we, get, we get down in the mouth when the weather's not just what we think it should be, right? Hope you didn't complain about the weather this morning. Um, you know, if the drive through isn't going as fast as we think it should, you know, they're out of something, our favorite whatever, online or in the store. I mean, wow, we're so fragile. And I'll be honest with you, um, these last three weeks have been pretty difficult for me. I'm usually up and about. I haven't been even close to this sick for five year, over five years is the last time I was thinking about this. I had a really bad flu uh, about five and a half years ago. And, uh, and, and so, you know, it's not easy being down. Uh, I was praying and, and, and saying, God, you know, when all my family comes in, because our whole family came in for Christmas, keep us all healthy so we can have a great time. And guess who got sick? Me. Christmas Day, I was miserable. I couldn't even be around anybody hardly. The next day as well. Uh, my, my little grandkids, my, my little grand buddies, uh, the little guys, um, Sparrow and others, they come up and say, Grandpa Wrestle, Grandpa Wrestle. And you don't know how much I wanted to wrestle with them and just get down on the carpet and roll around, have some fun. But I couldn't. I didn't feel up to it. I knew it wasn't good and, you know, giving them sickness and so forth. It, it was hard. And I don't tell you this so you feel sorry for me. And I don't tell you this to complain. I'm telling you this because it's a testimony. God's still working on me. Uh, I've had to learn to be faithful it didn't matter whether I'm here or there or what's going on. I got to be faithful day in and day out. I got to be faithful with my wife. By the way, uh, New Year's Eve, you know, we, we toasted the New Year's Eve with some medicine, you know, <laughs> went to bed early. It was great, you know, for better or worse, sickness or health, right? Isn't that what faithfulness is all about? And so God's teaching me, and I know he's teaching you as well. Are you surrendered? Are you allowing him to teach you what it means to be faithful unconditionally. Not when it's easy. Hey, everybody can do it when it's easy. But when it's hard, how do you respond then? There was a third key to their faithfulness, and that it was the fact that they were unselfish. You know, it was never about them. 
It was always about others. And that was clearly seen in the rest of this story as you look at it. Verse number 26 talks about this this earthquake. And it wasn't just a normal earthquake. They have a lot of earthquakes in that part of the world. But this was a supernatural earthquake that freed all the prisoners and opened all the doors and all their shackles came undone. That's not a normal earthquake and left standing right there. Verse 27 says the keeper of the prison then saw all this. He assumed the prisoners were going to escape, and then what was going to happen? He was dead meat. I mean, if you're the prison keeper, keeper and even one guy escapes, you are put to death by the Romans, and he knew that. And he would much rather take his own life than suffer at the hands of the Romans, and so he is ready to kill himself when what happens next verse, the apostle Paul steps in and says, hold it, don't do that, everybody's still here, hold on for a second. He regains his senses, he comes in, and then he asks this very important and needful question in verse number 30. He said, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And what is Paul's answer? He said, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved you and your household. Now, what he means by you and your household didn't mean that if the jailer got saved, automatically his whole household would be saved. No, what this means is Paul was just extending this, not just to the jailer, but to his household. If you believe, you'll be saved. You, it works that way, and for your household, and we find out later, his household did come to know Jesus once they heard the word of God preached. Well, what a beautiful picture. The jailer is ready to kill himself. It's the end He has lost all hope. My friend, I'm here to tell you today, and I don't know where you're at with some of this, but maybe you're there. You're like, I'm done. I'm depressed. I'm ready to check out of this life. Don't do it. Don't do it. God has a better plan. And that better plan is found in Jesus. And this jailer didn't even know him. And maybe you don't know him. And if you do know him, he's still the answer. You gotta look to him. You don't need to take your life. You need to live your life for the glory of God. God has a purpose and a plan. And for this case, the plan was for the jailer to come to Jesus. Notice Paul didn't say, hey, hey, jailer guy, go ahead and just be a good person and you'll be saved. Let us go and you'll get saved. No, what did he say? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means to trust him as your savior. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and it's not automatic that you get saved. It is when you come to him and you place your faith and trust in him that you get saved. You open your heart to him, and that's what makes the difference. And that's exactly what this jailer did, by the way. Uh, you look at what it said, you know, he, he received Christ, having believed in God with all his household. Verse 34 says, there's four evidences of his salvation, real quick. He showed love to Paul and Silas. Uh, he, He bandaged their wounds up. He cleaned them up. He took care of them. And then he publicly identified with Christ through believer's baptism. Very important. We've already mentioned that there's gonna be a baptism service here on February 11th. If you've never publicly identified with Christ as your Savior, your Lord and Savior in believer's baptism, I invite you to let me know and let's get that ball rolling so that you can be baptized. This Philippian jailer did it right away. And then he showed hospitality to them. He put food out there for them, and he rejoiced. You see, when you come to Christ, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. There's a change in your life. And if there's not a change in your life, you need to look and see, are you rooted in the rock? Are you really rooted in the rock? Because there's a lot of people who think they are. Oh, I'm a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home. I go to a Christian church. But they don't really know the Savior. Now, if you were to ask Paul and Silas if it was worth it all, what do you think they would say? Absolutely, right? Not that they would want to do it again, but they would do it again. Why? Because they weren't in it for themselves. They were in it for others. And to see this Philippian jailer, to see the miracle that God worked for him and his household to come to know Jesus as Savior, that was awesome. That's what they were living for. That's why they were in Macedonia. That's why they were in Philippi was to see people come to Jesus, and that's is what, exactly what was happening. Do you ever ask yourself why you do what you do? Do you do it for others, or do you do it for yourself? 
Uh, even sometimes I think we're, we're guilty of saying, God, bless me. I'll do all this, you know, so you'll bless me. It's not the right motivation. And Paul and Silas just did it because of the sake of others. Here's what Paul had to say, Philippians chapter 2. He said, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem others better than himself. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And he also said this, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. You see, he didn't want to dis be disqualified. And so he worked at faithfulness. He, he, he brought himself into subjection so that he could live and preach to others. Faithfulness means doing the right thing day in and day out for the sake of others. That's what it's about. It's dying to self and consistently showing love and sharing Jesus. It's built on this important principle, and you find this in principle in Luke 16 in verse number 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also must much. He is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. You see, the little things matter. We have to be faithful day in and day out. Everything. Dot your I's. Cross your T's for the glory of God. Be faithful when it's easy. Be faithful when it's hard. Do the right thing over and over and over again, and you'll get there. That's faithfulness. Now, I've been talking about my wife's grandmother, Blanche Collins, for a long time because she's 105 years old. And, you know, this is a bittersweet thing, but she passed away two days ago, okay? Friday afternoon, she went to be with her Lord and Savior, and uh, 105 years and seven months and some odd. Amazing. I mean, just think about that. I, I think she was born in like 19, whatever. You can do the math. Uh, before 1920, let's put it that way, okay? A long time ago. Can you imagine what she went through? Here's a, a five-generation picture here uh, with my, my uh, wife's grandmother, Blanche, and her mom, Bonnie, and Dawn, and Joanna, my oldest, and her daughter, um, uh, Shiloh. And uh, what a beautiful picture from a couple years ago. Go on to the next slide right here. And uh, this is a picture of Blanche last year on her 105th birthday back in May, and some of the quilts that she had made. She was a quilter. And so there's a secret to longevity right there. You got to be a quilter, I guess. I don't know. But uh, amazing, amazing lady. But here's what I want to talk about for a moment. Faithfulness. You know what I've observed for the last 10 plus years? My mother-in-law, Bonnie, and her sister, Dee, have taken care of their mom. Now, she's been in pretty good health, but it's not been an easy road because she's had dementia and, and a number of other things. But they've shuffled her back and forth at one person's house for a month and the other person's house for a month. They've done this for 10 years. and They've been the primary caregiver. And what I've seen is faithfulness day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out to show love to their mother all these years. And it just... I don't know, when I think about faithfulness and I thought about preaching this this Sunday, it's just like, folks, that's what it's about. Showing love to somebody else sacrificially in Jesus' name, even when it's hard, that's what God is calling all of us to do, right? Let's be more like that. Uh, let's be like Paul and Silas. What did they do? Paul and Silas, uh, they were rooted in the rock, they were faithful no matter what the circumstances were. They were living for others. That's what God wants you and I to do in this new year and every single day. So that eventually, by the grace of God, we will hear, well done, right? Well done, good and faithful servant. That should be the, the, the goal of all of us, to hear, well done. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm gonna make you ruler over many. Are you faithful? What's your next step to becoming more like faithful? I hope you're inspired by Paul and Silas like I am and continue to tap in to the rock, which is Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that you have for us to grow in you, to know you, to love you, to serve you. 
Help us to be faithful, God, day in and day out. Help us to know what true success looks like so that we don't waste our lives, that our lives are lived well for the glory of God for all eternity. I pray, Father, that you'd help us all to be building into our lives faithfulness, abiding in Christ, being faithful, being obedient, doing the hard things. Father, we need you. We need you. We need you as Lord and Savior. We need you as the strength of our lives. For when we are weak, you are strong. And all glory belongs to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. God's people together said, amen, amen. Well, let me just invite you, if you've made a decision today to, to be baptized or to follow Jesus or whatever it is, take the communication card, let us know about that, and I'll be glad to follow up on that with you. If you've got a prayer request, that's what the communication card is for as well. Fill that out, drop it in the boxes on your way out today, and I hope you have a great day in Jesus. Amen. Pastor Ken, so I get the privilege of um, celebrating a little bit with you. Um, it's been a year since we uh, actually started a little project of the other end of the building, and I thought of these words, it is finished, as I think of our Lord and Savior and all that he did on the cross for us. It is finished for us, and we have redemption um, of our sins because of what he did. But also on the human side of things, we started this project at the other end of the building, so we have a, now a new family bathroom and a new gathering room, which is about 95% done. Yep, amen. And we're able to celebrate that today. And I think of this verse, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Yes, it's your faithfulness that got it done, as Ken talked about today. Your faithfulness in giving, your faithfulness in um, just praying for this project and caring about the church. Um, it's a wonderful project that happened. Um, the bathroom is now it's got a, a changing station. It's great for kids with um, kids being changed. It's great for adults and senior citizens. And it's really a great, a great facility down, down at the other end. The kitchen is down there now in the new gathering space. And so the kids will be using that every Wednesday. Wonderful, wonderful thing. And this is actually over 20 people worked on this project. Um, so it's pretty amazing. The flooring, the painting, the lights, the drywall, the walls, everything. And it took a long time to put together. But because of the faithfulness of the teams that were here, they were actually able to get it done and save the church a lot of money too. And it's really turned out quite nicely. Um, so thank you. Thank you all very much for your faithfulness. Thank you for your support. And the thanks for the teams that put this all together. Um, you'll see it when you come down. Just go out the doors here, hang a left, go down the hallway, check out the new bathroom and the gathering space. Just check it out. See what it's all about. But um, So I also want to thank God for his faithfulness through all this. Amen. So I would like to pray and actually dedicate, um, I know it might sound strange dedicating a bathroom, but we're going to dedicate a bathroom and the gathering room, so please pray with me. Hey, Father, I thank you so much for uh, your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of um, each and every believer here and for their faithfulness in giving of their tithes and offerings, their giving and, um, of, of talents, Lord, as we could put this all together. Lord, as we pray about the future, we think about how these rooms will be used for your glory, for that family maybe that, that just needs a place to change a baby or for um, somebody that comes into this church that just needs to have a family bathroom for themselves. Or as I think of the gathering room and, and how Wednesday nights it's going to be filled with kids and, and every weekend it's used, Lord, to do studies, to do uh, worship and fellowship. Yes, Lord, we just pray that we continue throughout the years to use these as tools for your glory. So we thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So please come down and check it out after service. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's uh, stand and sing this last little song as we, uh, we leave today. Declare this together, that we would be faithful. Praying that our Father let his kingdom come, let his will be done. Let's sing it together. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth 
God bless you. You stay warm out there. Go Pack Go!